Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the November program in our Speaking of History lecture series, a monthly program sponsored by the Pinellas County Historical Society. I'm happy that you're able to join us today. This is our last program of this calendar year. We'll begin again in January of next year. Today's program is going to look at the environment by documenting the environment. And when we look at environmental studies, there are a lot of people out in the field doing research. But one of the other important areas of research isn't what happens necessarily on the ground, but in the archive instead. And today we have a great speaker to talk to us about that. Erin Mahaney is a graduate of New College of Florida, who then went on and pursued her master's studies in public history at North Carolina State University. And while working up there, she had an opportunity to learn about a lot of primary source materials. Fortunately for Florida, she came back and joined us again. And she's here uh, to talk about some of the work she has done at Boat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota and in other areas. One of her other activities is she's a director of the Society of Florida Archivists, which is a statewide organization to help preserve and promote Florida's documentary heritage. So we're very fortunate to have Erin talk today about documenting Florida's environment. Erin. Thank you very much uh, for coming and for having me here today. I'm very excited to share with you the project that we've been working on. I've been the archivist at Moat Marine Laboratory for the last four years, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with some really remarkable environmental collections at Moat Marine Laboratory, but it's also exposed me to the other kinds of environmental research available throughout our state. Uh, and recently we began a project called Consolidating the Record, which I will touch on a little bit today, and that document is available for you. I hope this presentation is interesting enough for you that, that you're interested in pursuing that. So to place this presentation in context a bit, uh, when I speak about Florida's environment or the environmental records of Florida, that's twofold. Um, I'm speaking not only about the literal history of Florida's environment, for example, um, the salinity of, of the coastal estuaries and the depth of the rivers and the way the landscape changed, I'm also talking about the history of environmentalism in Florida. And I know there have been numerous, numerous studies done on environmentalism as a subject of research. Uh, Florida is, as I'm sure you all know, very unique, not only in its history, but in the way its environment uh, was developed. So that gives environmentalism a bit of a different twist in Florida. And that's one of the things I'd like to go into a bit as well. And then, of course, the Consolidating the Records project that I mentioned a moment ago. And I have a, a copy of it here. It's still a work in progress, uh, so please forgive any errors. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, that image that you'll see there on your right is one of the pages from the Field Journal of Charles M. Breeder, Jr. He's a fairly well-known ichthyologist from the early 20th century, and he kept meticulous uh, field diaries. I'll talk a bit more about him later on, but I just wanted to show an example. He would show diagrams in his diaries of the experiments he did, um, exactly what time he woke up in the morning, when he went for a swim, things like that. So as a historical resource, it's incredibly valuable. So as I mentioned, environmental history, I want to give a shout out to the John C. Briggs Ichthyology Collection. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the collections that documents the environment. Um, the Moat Marine Laboratory records, which I'll go into in more depth in a moment. Um, and then part of this project is uncovering hidden collections. So I'm sure all of you have come across some sort of a small institution or records in someone's attic or something that's valuable that just isn't out there that people don't know about, so they can't access the information in it. Um, Archbold Laboratory, to some extent, is, is one of those. They have some really remarkable special collections that document the work that the laboratory has done since 1941, uh, but nothing's online, there's no finding aid, there's no catalogs for a lot of it. So when we actually traveled out to Lake Placid, Florida, and went to this room with you know, maps stacked ceiling high with no labels, and dug through the drawers to see what was there so that you know, we could share it, and hopefully um, someone will be interested in that work. So the types of records that you'll encounter when you're looking at the history of the environment itself, uh, natural history collections. I mean, everyone's very familiar with those. Um, species collections, herbaria, which are plants preserved on, on the papers and labeled. Um, one of the examples that I'll touch on in a moment is Mozart's herbarium collection, which is really remarkable. Uh, it's primarily from the 1950s on, but there's sort of a random book of 1870s algae off the coast of Ireland that, that is found there, so that's interesting as well. Data sets, they sound really boring, but if you're interested in charting the way something has changed, they're really, really helpful. And a lot of the environmental um, disasters that have occurred recently, most notably the oil spill, uh, people rely on what's called baseline studies. And baseline studies are an example of the way something looked 
before these changes happened, before the post-World War II development boom, things like that. Uh, field notes and research data, which in my opinion are the most accessible and the most fun for a non-scientist uh, like myself. And you can see an example there on the right, that's a daily collection log. So say your scientists go out and they catch X number of fishes, they'll list exactly what they caught, what the species was, how many of them they caught. And then today, scientists can reinterpret that and say, wow, this area was really heavy in you know, sea hairs. That meant that the ecology of this area was you know, X, Y, Z. So it's looking at these, these earlier data, data sets, research notes, field logs, and seeing how things have changed. Also, the collecting policies um, and the way people did research is important there as well. Uh, technical reports, by their name, you can tell they're a little dense, um, dense to read, they're very technical, but they do cover some more obscure aspects of environmental research. Uh, the Moat Marine Laboratory technical reports, in particular, cover some very specific kinds of, of research in very particular areas. So something that might not either merit or it may merit it, but it might not get the funding for an entire book, we do have um, those technical reports, and that's what we call gray literature. I'd like to draw your attention to that index card along the bottom. This is part of a species key card index file that was kept by um, an early marine research laboratory. And I just want to draw your attention to it now because I'm going to mention it again in a moment. But it says the species, when it was found, where it was found, and who found it. In this case, Stuart Springer, who went on to become a noted shark researcher. So, uh, Moat Marine Laboratory's environmental collections. I am going to go a little heavy on them just because I know them very well and I think they're fabulous and I want to share, share the information about them. These are our main collections, our, our biggest collections. The Bass Biological Laboratory collection, the Charles M. Breeder Jr. collection, and that's Dr. Breeder there on the left uh, inspecting a flying fish. He did a lot of work with flying fish. Uh, the Perry Gilbert collection. Perry Gilbert was particularly active following World War II and doing research on how to prevent shark attacks for downed airmen and things like that. Um, the Mina Walther collection. She was a biology teacher from Chicago, came to Florida and wrote nature columns for the Sarasota Herald for about 30 years. So her columns are very nice bite-sized chunks of nature and history and they're very accessible. And uh, we have the drafts of a couple of her publications. She has two books that are available as well. The Moat Technical Reports, which I mentioned. And then the uh, Moat Herbarium. I mentioned the 1870s specimens, um, but there's a lot more from the Gulf area from 1950s on, some noted scientists like Sylvia Earle, Dr. Jeannie Clark, who were involved in the herbarium. So the Bass Biological Laboratory Collection. Um, the Bass Lab operated in the 1930s and 40s in Englewood, Florida. It was the first um, co-educational year-round research and field collecting station in southwest Florida. Uh, it offered fellowships, so researchers from around the country would come they would do their research, use the facilities. They were expected to contribute a reprint of their findings and contribute to that key card index file I showed you a moment ago. Uh, and the great thing, my favorite part about this collection, is that it shows the scientific community, which was not that big in the early 20th century in the United States. So anyone, they would send out um, advertising to the different universities. They would solicit fellowships. And you end up getting some, some really well-known scientists, Harry Waldo Norris there, Lowell E. Noland, Archie Carr, Marjorie Harris Carr. Uh, we'll talk more about them in a moment. But after they left the Bass Lab, they stayed in touch. So they would write letters to and from the labs. They'd made friends there. They'd made friends with the, the Bass family. They'd made friends with each other. And the Bass Lab kept both sides of the correspondence. So we have this really rich correspondence series that talks about what they were researching, what college they were at, who they were promoting, um, what kinds of new scientists they were trying to bring up and into the field. Uh, things like that, which, was, which I think is, is really remarkable and really fascinating to see. Uh, also, their research, of course. For example, there's a series of records from about 1934 where the president of the sponge exchange in Tarpon Springs uh, was dealing with some sort of a sponge blight as sponges were dying off and the fishermen were upset and, and uh, they didn't have anyone on hand to investigate. They contacted the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, but they're just like, well, we don't have anybody in Florida right now because Florida at the time was still you know, largely unsettled in many areas. Um, so they contacted this laboratory and asked the founder, John F. Bass Jr., if he had anybody on hand. So he took Lowell Noland, he took Archie Carr, um, he took Ruby Bear, uh, who studied parasitic copepods, um, and they all went down to Tarpon Springs. And so their notes reveal some, some, fun, some fun dynamics between, for example, the sponge fishermen, you know, who would hook the, um, 
hook the fish out of the boats, and then the sponge divers, who would dive down to collect the sponges. It revealed that tension between those two styles of sponge fishing. Um, the comments from the fishermen regarding the president of the sponge exchange were far less than complimentary. Um, George C. Emanuel Jr. is a fat piece of baloney and oppressor of the working class, uh, was one of the comments that, that we found there. So they would try to deal with oyster parasites up in Apalachicola. So they would get to travel around and deal with these different problems throughout the state. And that figures into the local economies and things like that. So very helpful. I could go on about this collection, but uh, I'll move on. Um, it also had a profit-making subsidiary called the Zoological Research Supply Company. And that supplied specimens prepared for dissection to colleges and universities throughout the country, as well as to aquariums for display. The reason I mentioned the Zoological Research Supply Company is because sometimes they would import species that their clients wanted from, say, Cuba or Mexico, and sometimes they would escape. Um, so we do get some of our invasive, invasive exotics um, noted. I can't say that that's why they're there, but we do see some of that happening. The Charles M. Breeder Jr. Collection, as I mentioned, noted ichthyologist from the early 20th century. His field journals are really the richest part of his collection. They are excuse me, uh, day in, day out for a good 50 years of his life. He was extremely meticulous. He would say exactly how many of one fish he caught in that net at the same time each day. So not only is his work valuable in terms of the actual data uh, and understanding Dr. Breeder's research methods, but he, because he was a pioneer in a lot of ways, it shows the development of scientific methodology. It shows how people were beginning to do these research, the, the, these research methods. I mean, he took sound recordings of fish underwater before we had you know, waterproof technology. Uh, he was always up with the latest um, photographic equipment as well. So we have some photographs. He did some excellent hand-drawn illustrations. And a lot of these are available online at Moat's uh, online repository. And that's in that brochure in the back in case you're interested in seeing them. Uh, we have some of these journals transcribed and, and posted online. Uh, his personal papers, publications, and a number of film reels that we're currently hoping to have reformatted, so those will be accessible as well. Perry Gilbert Collection, as I mentioned, uh, post-World War II was working with the Navy to try to prevent shark attacks on downed airmen, was involved with the International File on Shark Attacks. A lot of his publication inc publications include research on the different ways they tried to prevent shark attacks, like the dyes or the, the sleeves that the airmen would get into when they went into the water, or using dolphins to try to help prevent shark attacks, uh, which is really fascinating stuff. Um, the film reels in particular look like they're going to be great. We're, recently, we're, we're currently writing a grant to try to get those reformatted as well. A lot of photographs. He was also the president of Moat Marine Laboratory for a number of years. And uh, the direction that Moat took in a research sense and the shark program there, um, a lot of that can be traced to Perry Gilbert's work there and his correspondence um, regarding his administrative correspondence during his time at Moat is, in, is useful for our institution. So just as an overview, I'm going to go into this in more depth. Um, I am not an environmental history researcher by trade, but being an archivist of environmental collections, you, you pick up a lot and, and you want to learn more. So if some of this is oversimplified, I do apologize. Um, Marjorie Harris Carr, there on the left, uh, was a federal wildlife technician. She also went to work at the Bass Biological Laboratory, the collection I mentioned a moment ago. Well there, um, Archie Fairley Carr, uh, a professor at the University of Florida, was also staying there. And they eloped during their time at the Bass Lab. And uh, the letters back and forth around the time that they got married are really fascinating. The Bass family threw them a big celebration. Um, they had both been employed and, and were close with the family, so it's kind of neat to see that. Uh, they both went on to become noted conservationists in their own right. Archie Carr primarily with sea turtles and very active in the Caribbean, and Margie Carr regarding the, Flo excuse me, the Cross Florida Barge Canal. Um, she spent about 20 years trying to stop the Cross Florida Barge Canal uh, during her lifetime. And again, this is my interpretation, but I would argue that the earliest movement in environmentalism, I'm shifting to the history of environmentalism now away from the history of the environment, although obviously they're very intertwined. Uh, naturalists would be the first people to document Florida's history. They would travel, they would collect things, they would draw pictures of things, they would write journals about it. Um, William Bartram, there's a, an example of one of his works there. He traveled to eight of the southern colonies, uh, they were colonies at the time, and took down his observations. Charles Torrey Simpson uh, was known as the Sage of Biscayne Bay. Um, he was a botanist. He was also interested in bivalves. Uh, 
Um, naturalists tend to be characterized by a broad interest in the world around them, not necessarily um, a specific scientific interest. Uh, David Fairchild was also a botanist. I believe he brought, um, he, he kind of tended to use Florida, particularly the edges of the Everglades, as his, his own garden. And he imported over 200,000 invasive exotic species and crops into Florida. <laughs> um, <Thank you. laughs> Uh, Thomas Barber, uh, they call him the last of the naturalists. Uh, his interests were also diverse. Um, he, was, he was also interested in herpetology, so amphibians, reptiles, things like that. Uh, his interests were, were diverse, particularly for the time period. In the early 20th century, people started to specialize a bit more. Uh, he wrote that Vanishing Eden about the way Florida's development was, was affecting the environment that we live in. Um, a lot of their writings pr provided the foundation for the future views, policies, and changes, as well as baseline studies. Um, Thomas Bartram, or excuse me, William Bartram, one of the earliest, a lot of his work in the St. John's River area and then near Payne's Prairie provided the baseline for what the research, excuse me, for the research done in, in the Payne Prairie area now. Um, the prevailing view at the time was that nature existed to benefit man. Uh, that this wasn't really challenged by the naturalists. It was, a, it was a dominant view. Nature was there to be used. Rivers were there to be navigable waterways. Animals were there to be game or food. Um, you know, soil was there to be farmed. So that, that didn't really change for the naturalists, but it was this, this appreciation and this desire to document it as it was, not necessarily what could be done with it at this point. So the conservationists. and. When I first started studying this, it was really fascinating because the idea was conservation was not incompatible with development at the time. The idea was use the interest, not the principle. Rational exploitation of your resources. Nature is truly there to be used by humankind, but we have to leave enough of it so that future generations can use those resources as well. That was really the idea behind conservationism. Uh, and I put utilitarian in there because it really emphasizes this idea that it truly was there to be used, not just appreciated. Gifford Pinchot, father of uh, forestry. Theodore Roosevelt, as you can see there on the right. Uh, May Man Jennings was Florida's first lady. And she particularly um, is a great example of this sort of back and forth between conservation for its own sake and conservation for utilitarian purposes. She saw nature as a way to solve societal ills. So nature is there to be exploited for farming, to give people jobs, to alleviate the labor shortage. She saw conservation and development as not necessarily incompatible. So when you have these early attempts to drain the Everglades, for example, a lot of conservationists were on board because it was making nature um, useful. For a long time, Florida, particularly South Florida and the Everglades, was seen as this unhealthy, unnecessary, useless swamp uh, where there were mosquitoes and animals and you couldn't get through it and you couldn't use it for farming. Um, so this idea of making it worthwhile, saving it to make it worthwhile, or excuse me, make it useful, uh, is, is a key component of the conservationists. Sportsmen and women, um, if, you, if there's nothing there to hunt, it's not fun to hunt. So you have to make sure that things are, are still there and that the animals aren't going away. Um, forestry boards and the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC was very active in our state park system, uh, but the idea was to reshape nature into a park, not necessarily a preserve. So they would, for example, reroute rivers sometimes. They would plant invasive exotics to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Um, it wasn't necessarily to protect the environment. It was to make it, um, I suppose, recreationally friendly. So some interesting components there. Uh, the preservationists existed around the same time as the utilitarian conservationists, and this is sort of a bit of a split. Uh, you see more of the transcendentalist movement in the preservationists. Um, John Muir separated from Gifford Pinchot. They were friends. They had diverging views on the way nature should be used. The main idea, I think, behind the preservationists is that nature is worth preserving simply for its own sake. It's there. It's worthwhile. It's beautiful. It's worth preserving. Um, Mary Barb Monroe is an example. Frank Chapman was an ornithologist. Um, George Perkins Marsh kind of flirted with conservationism and, and preservationism. He was a bit on both sides. The establishment of Royal Palm State Park was something that both utilitarian conservationists and preservationists were able to agree on. So you have people that were, at, on one hand, um, trying to rec reclaim the Everglades and promote drainage, 
that are also lobbying for Royal Palm State Park, an area for it to be protected. So there, there was nothing incompatible in, in that view, but they were able to work with the preservationists in order to save certain sections of Florida beginning as early as 1969. I would call them nascent environmentalists as we think of them today. So the modern environmental movement, uh, as we think of it today, has a different element to it. I would argue that environmentalism, as we think of it today, is the idea that nature is necessary to preserve, because if we don't, then humanity will not survive, essentially. It's a necessity rather than an option. It's a, if we do not take care of this environment, we will not be able to exist as well. Um, in addition to nature being worthwhile for its own sake. But for example, if you pollute the water, you will not have water to drink. You must keep the water clean. So it's a, a little more dire, a little more urgent, I think, for these 20th century environmentalists. Uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, obviously extremely well known. Remarkable, remarkable woman, particularly involved with the Save the Everglades program and the establishment of the Everglades National Park. She lived to be 108, and she began her Everglades campaign at the age of 79. Uh, so remarkably active woman. Um, Arthur Marshall was a scientist, conservationist, and a biologist and administrator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, he created a blueprint for Everglades restoration that we still use to this day. And Ruth Bryan Owen was um, Florida's first congresswoman. She was good friends with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. They had, they had a good time together. She was also a minister to Denmark. She was the daughter of William Jennings Bryant. And another key component of the environmentalists, I would argue, is that it forms a coalition of disparate groups. You'll see a lot of sportsmen involved in the environmentalist movement now. You'll see a lot of um, politicians on both sides of the political spectrum involved in, in some environmental movements. Uh, you'll see people that may have different views about what should happen after you save it, but the idea is still that it needs to be saved. So a couple things differentiated the modern environmental movement from, say, the utilitarian conservationists or the preservationists. Uh, there was a lot more of a grassroots effort. It was a, a lot more, this affects everyone. This isn't just for the transcendentalists. This isn't just for the scientists. This isn't just for the naturalists. This is for everyone. Part of that was the publication of Silent Spring in 1962 uh, and River of Grass in 1947. These were two key environmental works that really pointed out what we stood to lose should these resources not be protected. Um, the New Left movement, particularly in academia, also emphasized an interdisciplinary component. It was this idea that you don't look at um, a field in a vacuum, that you have to look at all these different components. And environmental history began to take off academically at that point as well. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Florida has some very unique resources. We have a huge swamp of, of fresh water. We have rivers in the north. We have springs. We have a lot of different climate zones. Uh, and the temptation to exploit Florida's resources had been uh, fairly irresistible for a lot of developers. But for a long time, these resources were, were almost impenetrable. And then our Florida legislature got tied up. So for a long time, Florida's resources actually benefited from this kind of benign neglect, where people couldn't access them to exploit them because they couldn't quite get their act together. So to talk about sportsmen and environmentalism, uh, William R. Moat, the namesake of uh, Moat Marine Laboratory, he was a great supporter. He was an avid sports fisherman. Let's see, Johnny Jones. Johnny Jones ushered 66 environmental acts through the Florida legislature in his lifetime. And he paired up and made a bit of a triumvirate with um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Arthur Marshall. And the way this, this sort of trio worked was that Arthur Marshall would provide the scientific, scientific expertise and the knowledge. Uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas would do the public outreach and the education, and Johnny Jones would do the lobbying. Uh, and it, it proved to be quite effective. Some of the current ways that sportsmen are involved in the environmental movement includes tag and release, uh, for example, when when they catch sharks for some of these big shark fishing competitions, it's now a tag and release rather than you know, a string it up kind of thing. Uh, they're encouraged to do mouth swabs of the tarpon they catch and send the DNA back uh, to certain laboratories so they can see what the tarpon population is doing. So it makes them invested in the resources. It also means that, that the sport continues. Um, the environmental movement in many resources is portrayed primarily as a male occupation. Uh, but that was notably not the case, particularly in Florida. Uh, the rise of women's clubs in Florida meant that you had a really socially active group during the progressive era that was arguing for the cleanup of this, of this environment, the protection of these resources. And when women ran into opposition for trying to move into 
a field traditionally dominated by men, like the legislative areas or the public speaking areas or things like that, they would use the argument of civic motherhood. This idea that, well, it's my job to keep my family healthy. If they don't have clean air to breathe or clean water to drink, then they're not healthy. Uh, and that took them a little bit outside this traditional sphere in the environmental movement. I've talked about some of these women already, but I think the thing to remember is that they all had different views of conservation or preservation or environmentalism. Some of them would argue that, no, draining the Everglades for agricultural land is the best use of this resource. Some would argue, no, you know, stop this, save it, set it aside. And uh, still others, some of their papers would reflect more development-based and less concern for the environment in general, but the papers are still valuable because it shows um, the other things that have happened, the non-positive things that have happened. So Florida's environmental history in a nutshell. <laughs> like I said, Florida was seen as impenetrable for a very long time. Um, it was populated by very few people, uh, some Seminoles. Um, it, it was not developed for, for a long period of time. In 1850, the Swamp and Overflowed Lands Act basically gave um, land to the states that they could give away or sell at will for the purposes of, of reclamation, which would mean draining and making it usable for agriculture. Um, this didn't really take off until after the Civil War when Florida was um, in a lot of debt and then the Great Giveaway happened. So what happened was we ended up, um, excuse me, Florida ended up giving away a lot of land to people who would promise to reclaim it, develop it, turn it from swampland into agricultural land, and then nothing would happen. So Florida, the fund that was managing this, got a little deeper into debt. And we're talking about 60% of Florida at this point that they're trying to give away to reclaim from swampland. Um, the Reclamation Act of 1902, uh, and then the attempts for, for railroads. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the story of Henry Flagler and his railroads. Um, but the attempts to build railroads across these areas or through these swamps to open up areas was another factor. This sort of ended in about 1881 when Hamilton Diston um, bought, I think, he bought four million acres outright, but promised to develop 12 million acres of Florida into um, usable land, uh, which didn't, didn't get too far. Uh, he developed some areas of his own acres uh, and, and drained some of that. But because it was such a huge job, we're talking about, I think, a number of Northeastern United States combined in this area. Uh, Again, this is what I mean by benign neglect. Like, they would have loved to, but they can't, and therefore Florida's environment survived a little bit longer. Uh, the plume craze was a turning point in the environmental movement. Uh, around 1870, the fashion for ladies' hats became uh, very feather heavy, as you can see on the top there. Uh, snowy egrets, um, a lot of the plume birds, the wading birds, and the shore birds became extremely popular for hat fashions. Sometimes you would see entire birds on top of, of women's heads. Um, by 1886, five million birds were being slaughtered in a year. So you have local, um, local Florida hunters that would go into the Everglades to collect the birds. It would take four birds to make um, an ounce of feathers. And an ounce of feathers was at one point selling for the same price as gold. So this was very big money. Um, and what would happen was you would have these, these local people that would know how to get in and out of the swamp, they would go and they would shoot up, say, a rookery. A rookery is where birds come together for protection. They also nest there. And the most popular feathers were the aigrets, which come out in, plume, or excuse me, in uh, mating time. So mating time and nesting season are when these birds are the most valuable in the springtime. So what happens is you have your hunters, they go into the rookery, they shoot the adult birds, and they leave the hatchlings. So the hatchlings all die out. Um, they're eaten by animals, they starve to death. Um, you, you get some really gruesome pictures of, of what's happening at this point. Even with some of the silent rifles, the birds would rise up to protect their nests, and then all the other birds would rise up, and that made it very easy um, to wipe them out. We lost about 95% of our shorebirds at this point. We used to have flamingos in Florida until the plume craze. Um, so again, five million a year were going out. Uh, and then the Florida Audubon Society began to hire wardens because there wasn't obviously anybody to patrol the Everglades. It was still a pretty rough area. So they hired um, several wardens. One of them was called Guy Bradley. And he was the, as they say, the first martyr to environmentalism. He was actually killed by a plume hunter trying to defend a rookery for Florida's birds. And um, 
his death sort of galvanized the movement. And in, in addition, the idea that so many hatchlings would be dying in such a horrible way to make fashions for hats. So that, that really took hold with a lot of people. Even former hunters were like, yeah, this doesn't seem quite right. So that marked a definite shift. In the early 1900s, um, anti-interstate feather trafficking became illegal, or excuse me, feather state trafficking um, between different states became illegal. Uh, New York passed a law in the early, I think about 1910, that prohibited feathers coming in from out of states for the industry. So the hat makers and the hunters were still pushing for it, but the plume, the um, fashion in plumes diminished after that, except among prostitutes, and that made everybody else want to wear them even less. So they, uh, that diminished, the need for them diminished as well. The Everglades, there's a lot of research on the Everglades. I won't go into it in great depth, but it's sort of continually under attack. It's continually um, viewed as something that needs to be controlled or reclaimed. The way the Everglades used to work was Lake Okeechobee would overflow, and it would go all the way down the Everglades, and it would go down and into the sea. But um, as communities were built along Lake Okeechobee, and then those communities were flooded, dams were built to protect the communities, which cut off the water flow to the rest of the Everglades. Um, the Biscayne Aquifer provides the majority of water for um, South Florida, including Miami, and the water management in the Everglades is, is sort of an ongoing problem. Uh, invasive exotics, I'm sure you all have heard of the Burmese python issue down in the Everglades. Um, Burmese pythons are, are uh, exotic pets that people have. When they get too big, they tend to let them go. In South Florida, this is extremely dangerous because the Burmese pythons love this habitat. Uh, it's very friendly to them. They also have no natural predators, and the animals aren't used to seeing them, so they're really wiping out the small mammals. Um, and when Burmese pythons and the alligators meet, it's always sort of a toss-up as to who's going to come out on top, because sometimes the alligator will bust the python open, and sometimes the python will swallow the alligator. So that's fun as well. Um, so a lot of issues there. Earlier on, uh, there was a scientist who wanted to try to drain the Everglades by natural means. So he planted an Australian type of tree called a melaleuca. And this really does suck up water. So it, it did have the desired effect, but it's also uh, proliferated quite a bit. So we have some serious problems with invasive exotics throughout Florida. Um, air pollution. If, I'm gonna, if I can backtrack just a little bit to the 1940s, uh, you see some fascinating effects of air pollution, particularly in the Jacksonville area. Um, there were paper mills and phosphate fertilizer plants in the Jacksonville area, and they were located primarily um, in near working class or African American communities, and the air pollution got so bad that on two occasions, once in 1949 and once in 1965, women on their way to work had their nylon stockings literally evaporate off of their legs um, from the, the fluoride in the air. Uh, so. Needless to say, people were very concerned. Um, a lot of letters went on, but it took decades, and there was not a lot of response from, from the government, so people were very frustrated about the air pollution. I want to say fluoride as a result of the processing of the phosphate fertilizer and the paper mills. Um, another air pollution issue is in the Polk and Hillsborough County areas, that area of central Florida for the phosphate mining. The byproducts of that uh, released into the air do cause problems. Um, at one point, Florida was providing 30% of the world's phosphate. And at one point, everyone thought this is great, you know, this is a, a big industry. But then the other industries present in that part of Florida, for example, citrus and cattle, started to die off. You know, you're losing your oranges, you're losing your cattle, people's windows are starting to erode away. Um, so that was very noticeable as well. Um, you do get environmental justice issues in this as well. So it's not just the women's clubs of Florida. When we think of uh, social activism in this period, we tend to think of um, white middle class women and the women's clubs, but air pollution, pollution affects everyone. And in particular, in Jacksonville, the neighborhoods that were located near the worst of, of these areas uh, were working class families. So you see, um, you see different groups come together to try to fight this, which is fascinating as well. The Cross Florida Barge Canal, there's an image of it on the bottom right. Um, people have been wanting to build a canal across Florida since 1567. Uh, most of the 20th century, they slowly worked their way across. Uh, Marjorie Harris Carr uh, tried to fight this for about 20 years. The Ocklawaha River used to flow freely in that area. And there's, uh, you can see the Rodman Dam there. Oh, I can't see it too well. It's right about there. Uh, and in, in 1991, it was finally put to rest, the idea that, okay, no, we're not gonna actually do a canal across Florida in this part. But 
at that point, no one is willing to let the river flow again because the Rodman Dam has created something called the Rodman Reservoir. And in the reservoir, there's a lot of bass. So it's become very popular for bass fishing. And it's created its own ecosystem. It's a built ecosystem. Um, but it's sort of a trade-off. So you have a new ecosystem instead of the one that you had before. Let's see. Jim could tell you a lot more about Boca Ciega Bay than I can, so I'm not going to go into depth with that. But those are uh, dredge and fill operations, primarily in the St. Pete area. Uh, the, one of the few silver linings, I suppose, is that we get some legislation out of that that requires builders to try to do studies on the environmental impact before that happens. Uh, and following that, in, and it's not up here, but in 1972, we have the Wetlands, Recl or excuse me, the Wetlands Act. And what that does is it says that not only do you need to provide a study before you build something that might potentially damage wetlands, you, excuse me, you need to replace the wetlands, essentially. You need, if you damage them, you need to create a replacement for them. Now, the location and the quality of the replaced wetlands is usually up in the air. But, um, and then, of course, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill that I mentioned in 2010. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't tend to come out on top for a lot of these. Uh, the history of Florida's environmental movement is, is rarely a positive one. Uh, more often than not, it's the tale of tireless advocates that work for decades and at best obtain compromises. But, you know, we're working on it. And that's why these resources are so helpful, so we can know what's happened and how to move forward. So if you're interested in environmental research, uh, these are just some suggestions. And again, they're all included in this publication called Consolidating the Record. That is a freely available online as a PDF through Moat's Institutional Repository. Environmental Collection Guides, uh, this is not the only one. In the back of a book called uh, Ditch of Dreams, the one about the Florida Barge Canal, with um, Noel and Ted Tejeder, I believe, are the authors. They have a really great resource in terms of the environmental collections that they used for their book. So there are other ones out there. Uh, we try to reference as many of them as we can find in here. Bibliographies and our, uh, excuse me, acknowledgments of some of the key works. We have a suggested reading list in here as well. Florida State Archives, um, your universities and colleges, public and private, their special collections are incredibly rich resources. Even if it doesn't say environmental on the title, um, you may have, for example, a donor whose family turned out to be involved in a land development issue who ended up producing a study that would be helpful. Uh, the Florida Memory Project, from which a lot of these images are taken, a uh, really great resource. And then, of course, these Reclaiming the Everglades and the Everglades Digital Library uh, is, is very friendly. It's very navigable. That's available online. Um, the papers of individuals. Uh, individuals do tend to donate their papers. You can find a lot of great stuff there. Usually, um, if correspondence tends to be separated, if, for example, you only have one side of a correspondence, it would be really helpful to, to look at the papers of the individual. These are just some of the people that we've talked about already. Um, papers of organizations. This is really fascinating as well. A lot of the information we have on Marjorie Harris Carr, for example, comes from the Florida Defenders of the Environment collection because she was, she was very involved with that group. Um, she doesn't have a set of papers individually, but you'll find information on her in Archie Carr's papers, in Florida Defenders of the Environment, and in papers relating to the Cross Florida Barge Canal. So if you're interested in a particular individual, you kind of need to search around for that. Government entities, past and present. I say past and present because government entities change their names a lot. Um, for example, this, this letter here from the Bass Lab Collection is from the Florida State Board of Conservation. We don't have a Florida State Board of Conservation anymore. Um, but their resources are incredibly helpful because they were regulating what you could and couldn't do with species at the time. So when the Bass Lab wanted to know if they could keep a manatee in their backyard, they would write to the Florida State Board of Conservation who said, no, like manatees are already protected. You, you can't do that. Um, it also gives the okay about whether or not you're allowed to import invasive species, not invasive at the time, but exotic species from another country. So if you wanted to bring in, you know, five rare toads from Cuba, you would write to the State Board of Conservation and say, how do I need to get through customs for this? So they did a lot of interesting stuff with that. So the goals of the collection guide when we started were to consolidate the record because as a researcher, you know that once you discover something, you discover something else, and it keeps going, and it gets bigger, and it can, it can get a little intimidating, particularly with a subject as, as big as environmentalism or Florida's environment. So the idea was to kind of give you a good starting place. Uh, it's geared towards students, general researchers, scientists, and historians. It's rather broad, but some of the collections are very technical and include data sets. Some of them are very accessible, like the correspondence among scientists. So it would depend on your research interests. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, to help uncover hidden collections, the collections that no one knows about that are tucked away in someone's office or someone's basement, that would be incredibly valuable and helpful. Um, we also wanted to solicit input from repositories throughout the state. So when, we, when I initially gave a different version of this talk for the Society of Florida Archivists, it was wonderful because I had people come up and say, well, I've got this collection and I never thought about it, but it has this environmental component as well. Uh, so it, it helps us uncover that too. So a special thank you to the Pinellas County Historical Society and Heritage Village, uh, also to Mount Marine Laboratory and New College of Florida. Gail Donovan, the archivist at New College of Florida, helped put together a lot of this. Um, this is an image from the Bass Biological Laboratory collection of them on a picnic. Um, the founder of the laboratory is there on your right, John F. Bass, Jr. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you.